All right. I'm here with Chris Conte in Washington, D.C. at the office of Steptoe and Johnson on a snowy November 15th doing an oral history for the SEC Historical Society covering Chris's career in the Division of Enforcement at the SEC. And we usually like to start our interviews with a little discussion about your background, about sure. where you grew up, where you went to college, how you got interested in the law. Happy so to. Can you tell me a little about that? Happy to, Harlow. Thanks for having me. Um, I uh, grew up in Connecticut and um, went to undergrad at Brown University. Uh, and um, when I graduated from uh, Brown, I really didn't have a sense as to where I was going to be going long term. I ended up uh, getting a job in retail. I uh, came to Washington, D.C. and worked for the Heck Company in, the, uh, in their management training program. After about two years at, at being at the Heck Company, I decided I'd give law school a, a shot and see what that was like. Uh, and um, went to Catholic University here in DC and uh, took a, a job at Steptoe, uh, where I obviously am now. Uh, I was in their summer program and then came to Steptoe and worked there for four years. Did you have an interest in securities law in law school? Did that, when did that develop? Um, I would say my interest in securities law developed when I was thinking about leaving Steptoe. <laughs> Um, I was not a person who, you know, had a, I don't know if I think I may have taken one securities class in law school. Um, my interest really wasn't so much in securities law as much as it was what it was that the SEC and Division of Enforcement did. Okay. How, would you, how would you describe that then? Because I'm curious about why, why you chose when you left the firm to go to the Division of Enforcement or what attracted you to that? So. I was a litigation associate at Steptoe, and while I loved being here and I loved all the people, I didn't find the work at the time to be particularly inspiring. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm a competitive person. I like to win. Mm -hmm. Litigation is often about trying to win. Um, and. I enjoyed that aspect of it, but I, you know, I really wasn't uh, someone who loved to write briefs. I didn't, uh, you know, uh, love the uh, the the all of the sort of bickering and back and forth that went along with typical litigation. What I really enjoyed doing was taking depositions, reviewing documents, figuring out what happened, but when you get to the deposition stage in litigation, it's not actually trying to figure out what happened. It's about creating a record that's going to be um, successful for your objectives. So when I was looking for you know, places I might want to go, um, the SEC stood out over a number of others because you know, I had spoken to people who were working there at the mm -hmm. time, and they said, look, you get to investigate. You get to find out what happened. You know, you get to go through the documents and ask the questions, and it's really more of an open-ended kind of effort to try to really explore uh, and determine what happened. And uh, so I found that idea to be very uh, appealing. Uh, on top of it, um, it seemed like the work of the commission and the SEC at the time, and still to this, to this day, mm -hmm. was very meaningful. Um, you know, it, doing litigation uh, was oftentimes about sort of, okay, who, who's going to write the bigger check or write the check or whatever. Um, but it, I didn't feel that I was making much of a difference in the lives of, of, of people, if you will. Um, so the idea of, of investigating possible violations of the federal securities laws and uh, bringing you know, uh, some redress to, uh, you know, sort of people who have been harmed and to try to prevent harm going forward. All of those things were very attractive to me when I was thinking about uh, where to go after Steptoe. So you joined the SEC in 1992 after a couple of extraordinary decades in the, in the history of the Enforcement Division, dating from Judge Dworkin, and then the 1980s, a lot of high-profile cases, insider trading, and so forth. So what was your impression, what, before you sort of walked in the doors, what was your image of the SEC? You've already answered that a little. Right. 
uh, I knew nothing but good things about the SEC. Um, you know, it, I told people I was going to go work there, and uh, particularly um, at Steptoe, there's a strong history of government service amongst the folks who work. And um, there were all sorts of examples here of people who spent time in the government. And so, you know, going to government and government service certainly had, uh, was held in high regard. And the SEC in particular, again, I knew people who were working there and they just loved their jobs. They, they loved the, the sort of the, the mission of it. They loved, you know, doing the work um, of the investigations. And so, you know, I, I, you know, felt very confident that, you know, I was going to a place that um, had a terrific reputation that did meaningful work and sort of the, was, uh, you know, as uh, corny as it sounds, you know, an example of sort of good government and good for, you know, the, the people. So I'm curious about both your early career and I guess the early career of, a, of, a, of any staff attorney at the SEC. So when you first came in, you said you had not done a lot of securities or maybe taken one securities class. So how, what kind of initial matters did they put you on? I'm also curious about what kind of training you might have gotten. Right. So when I came in, it was the fall of 1992, and it was interesting because there, I had gotten hired, I had told folks here I was leaving, and then there was a hiring freeze. And so <laughs> my actual departure got delayed, you know, weeks and then months. And so I, I showed up, um, I think it was in the fall of 92. And um, at the time, there really wasn't anything um, that uh, that I was sort of put on. I think in part because um, at the time, uh, the there was a group of folks who were finishing up a very significant investigation involving Solomon Brothers and the Treasury auction scandal. And because I had had a litigation background, mm -hmm. uh, when I came in uh, pretty early on, people said, well, I th think you would be good for for that and so um, that ended up being that case that litigation ended up okay. being brought relatively soon so for my first couple of weeks months I was just analyzing some trading records that uh, to see if they might be um, uh, reflect a potential you know some sort of case we'd want to investigate at the time so and then that's before they moved you on to the Salomon Brothers. Yes. Matter. And then what did you do with Salomon Brothers? Obviously, the auction rate securities case, a very big deal in the early 90s. Um, so this involved um, uh, Salomon Brothers submitting false bids um, in the Treasury uh, auctions. And so what happened there is that Salomon Brothers would end up uh, through false bids and unauthorized customer bids uh, acquiring uh, substantially more, you know, of the securities the, the, than they could have otherwise. And so um, when I first got put on that matter, uh, the two managing directors who had been sued, the, uh, uh, Paul Mosier and Tom Murphy were the, the principal defendants. And there were also criminal investigations that were uh, going on at the, at the same time. So. My job, we were in, you know, right, we, we had written the complaint and we were going to go forward with discovery. So it was document review, motions, uh, you know, writing, responding, but then doing deposition, deposition prep and the like. And it's my understanding there was a separate trial unit within the Division of Enforcement. Is that something, I don't know if you were assigned to it or did you just work with them? I just worked with them at the time. Um, there was and remains a trial unit in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, sort of the approach to how the trial unit works with the investigative side of the division of enforcement has been tinkered with uh, over the years. But I, um, I ended up working with um, with a, a gentleman there who's an institution, um, Kevin O'Rourke, okay. who uh, was uh, known for his sort of idioms. And you know, when you walked in, he spoke to Kevin. You know, so what do you hear? What do you say? Sort of, sort of like right out, right out of James Cagney. And uh, Kevin would say, uh, "Now give me the color." I, like, I, what do you mean? Give me the color? It means he didn't want an explanation of what actually happened. He wanted to know what the room was like. And 
did people seem nervous? It was all, you know, sort of the soft kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, you now he said, I don't want you. I don't want your deliberate thought here, or deliberate reflection. I just want your, you know. And so he, Kevin was great, but he loved to push buttons, and uh, that played out a few times when uh, he was taking the depositions, and there was a little bit of upheaval at, at, uh, in a couple of those. But uh, great guy, great, great to work with as well. And those cases ended up uh, ultimately settling. So if that was your early experience, how would you describe, I mean, I guess that was your training then, is to work <laughs> alongside them. What did you take away from that? Um, well, I, it was great to have that opportunity so early on to work on something that was, uh, you know, so significant uh, and important. Um, but it wasn't the real, you know, sort of typical work, at least okay. on the investigative side, for for staff attorneys. Um, and so, you know, I didn't do that full time, but as I sort of did that and started to get more sort of um, sort of uh, rolled in, if you will, to the division. I started, you know, doing cases that were, you know, the typical kinds of cases a staff attorney would work on early mm -hmm. in their career, you know, insider trading and financial fraud. Um, at the time, you know, sort of pump and dump cases. So all of those started to sort of end up on my plate as I was sort of uh, going, working my way through my staff attorney years. Okay, and you say typical, is that because it was typical for the Division of Enforcement or because it was typical for relatively junior attorneys to be given those kind of matters? Um, you know, I think both. You know, at the time, and obviously all of this changed at, towards the end of my career sure. when Rob came in as director and the division went to specialized units. There were no real specialized units at the time. Everybody was a generalist. And so there were certain cases that uh, people, uh, the supervisors felt were good cases to learn uh, on. Uh, and there were frequently many um, of these kinds of investigations that you could pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of them turned into a matter that ended up being brought, but insider trading, uh, pump and dump, um, offering frauds, uh, you know, financial frauds, those are all, you know, the types of cases that certainly back then and certainly to a degree now still remain very prominent. And, um, and so they are, uh, they were the work of what every, most everybody did, but also the kinds of things people worked on early in their careers. Okay. How much, uh, I guess my question is the autonomy you had against oversight that was provided you. So when you were given a matter, who did you, did you work on it alone? Did you work with other individuals? And to what extent did you have, were you provided significant oversight by right. the division? So, um, you know, when I came in, there wasn't any real sort of formal training um, that I sort of remember. Mm -hmm. um, you sort of learned as you, or sort of went along, and you relied on your branch chief, uh, who was your first line supervisor, uh, to sort of assist you in the day-to-day -day, uh, work. So, you know, writing a subpoena, uh, you know, how to review documents, what to review for, um, how to take testimony, uh, do a testimony outline. All those things, uh, to a significant degree, were sort of learn as you go. But the branch chief would sort of advise and assist um, in in your training with respect to that. Um, but also, you know, give you overall, you know, um, uh, objectives, purposes, help you identify issues. So that, and the the branch chief was was there in most every instance when you took testimony early early on um, so that uh, they could sort of jump in and help if, uh, if necessary. Okay. Were any of those more, I don't want to say ordinary, but perhaps the more typical matters particularly memorable for you looking back? There are a couple that I can remember um, as a staff attorney. Um, there was a financial fraud investigation that we were doing um, it was, you know, sort of a, a company uh, that was a new company trying to gain traction, had a good product, but, a, but one that was still sort of suffering um, some quality issues. And I think I remember that I was, a couple of aspects, I remember looking at documents and I'm looking at these billing invoices 
and I'm looking at the, the, the one on the left, and I'm looking at the one on the right, and there's something odd about the lettering for what is otherwise the same company name. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, well, why does that zero have a line through it, and why does that zero not? And it occurred to me at that moment that one had been generated in a computer and the other one had been typed. And before you know, long, we realized that on, you know, on midnight, just before midnight on 1231, because none of these orders were gonna actually ship and bill in time, they took a, comp a typewriter and they typed up all the invoices and billing documents because the computer couldn't be altered in that way. <laughs> And so I remember just sort of because I, for some dumb reason, was looking at it, realized that all these things had been backdated, the documents had been falsified. Um, and I remember the CFO, I mean, the CEO who came in and cried in testimony. Um, and he said, you know, Mr. Conte, I hope someday you'll appreciate, you know, I'm not a bad person. I didn't mean to do bad things, but I had so many people depending on me, you know, people's jobs and families, you know, and wherever I, I you know, maybe we made some mistakes and I think the lesson I took away from that is that look there's some really evil bad people in the world most people want to and try to do the right thing but they're put in very difficult situations and it's hard to make the right choice and do the right thing either because they feel responsibilities or because other people come to them and put pressure on them a lot of my cases you know over time were examples of just people who for one reason or another just, um, they had a, a moment of failure, not that they were truly bad, greedy people. Look, there were certainly those, but I, I remember that being an aspect of that case and just appreciating, again, sort of the human element of, and the human condition of what happens. Does that change the way you deal with though either those individuals or deal with perhaps future individuals you're investigating? So um, the way it worked for me was to, and I would always sort of coach and advise the staff attorneys, and I would always say to them, look, you know, what you are investigating has happened in people's lives. They know everything about it. They lived it. You need to learn it as, as if you lived it. I said, because if you do, then when you step into testimony, you will see and be able to draw relationships between documents and words and emerge. Because in getting back to your point, mm -hmm. in order to be effective, you need to tap into something that is, has occurred with that person that might open them up to say something that they may not have otherwise been prepared to do when they walked in. Um, so to me, it was always trying to sort of humanize it. And so that experience of having that CEO talk very personally about what had happened, if you try to understand about the human dynamics of things, you can relate to people across the table and they may open up and reveal things that they weren't otherwise prepared. So that's one example of how that situation, uh, for me at least, carried forward into trying to become a more effective investigator. Okay. Would it ever have changed the way you felt about penalties, about the, the staff's response to, apart from the right. making you a better investigator? Um, you know, I think, it did, mm -hmm. um, um, you know. I uh, I always look. You know, you a lot of times you would you would in matters um, you would want to try to find precedent for what you uh, were doing. So comparable cases should be dealt with comparably. That's sort of how the government ought to be. Um, so on some level, um, you would sometimes be constrained because the, the, the way to charge it or the penalty or the approach, you know, you had five or 10 other cases that looked pretty similar and that kind of set the domain. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so sometimes you really didn't have a whole lot of 
uh, latitude that you could uh, utilize. But, um, but, but no, I think even if, even if it was a case where discretion may be on the charging or the penalty side, you, you know, maybe in terms of how you wrote it up or at least maybe how you dealt with the lawyer or how you dealt with the person, you know, you could, you know, take um, and be sort of more humanistic as, sure. as part of it. Okay. Can you, uh, I don't want to take too much time, but can you walk a little through how a typical matter would have, you would, how you would have walked a typical matter from beginning to end sure. while a staff attorney? Sure. Well, as a staff attorney, um, you know, the, the staff was, there was no office at the time of tips, complaints, and referrals. It was people would read things in the newspaper, uh, people would hear, uh, get, uh, uh, you know, uh, re uh, referrals from what was then the NASD. Mm -hmm. um, you might have some companies come in and self-report. So uh, things would just sort of come in through some mechanism uh, or another, and you'd get assigned to it. Um, you would, uh, you know, typically, um, you know, while there is informal and there's formal, frequently you knew pretty early on that it was something you were going to need a subpoena for. So it's not like cases got worked up for three months or six months and then transitioned. Typically, you knew, okay, I'm going to need subpoenas to do this, and you sort of went to that. And uh, getting a formal order from the commission okay. wasn't a particularly high bar. Okay. I think the standard has always been sort of official curiosity, although uh, that said, um, certain commissions have wanted to um, uh, uh, sort of uh, be more engaged early on. And so, you know, practices around formal orders, there was delegations that, that certainly occurred under Rob, and then those things, I think, got, you know, sort of pushed back a little bit. So um, anyway, you, uh, you figure out what documents you need, you write up your subpoena, send it out, um, you collect the documents, you review them, you, if you see things that are, you know, reflective of further inquiry, you develop a testimony outline, you start bringing people in, ask them questions, and then kind of at the end, um, you know, together with your branch chief at the time, assess the record. Is there more that we need to do? Is there not? Is there a potential violation? Uh, or not, if there is, then you go forward with what then was the Wells process. There was less sort of, um, you know, sort of white paper stuff that went on. And, uh, and then you would engage with counsel and you'd pretty quickly uh, discern whether or not this was something that, um, you know, you had, you had gotten right uh, or felt you were right. Engage with counsel, engage with the opposing yeah. parties. Yeah, opposing counsel, Wells submissions, you would review the record. Uh, you'd either feel good about what you'd done or realize maybe you'd left some things that you missed or, or shouldn't have focused on. Mm -hmm. And typically, you know, uh, the cases settled. Um, not all of them, but a large number of them did. And then you're sort of uh, taking whatever the recommendation is, uh, whether it's to recommend that a matter be brought and settled or a matter be brought and litigated. And back then, um, the trial unit got involved only after the investigation was done. That model's been, again, tinkered okay. with over time. So that's really the sort of, you know, from start to finish, how an investigation was, was done. Okay. And in 97, you became a branch chief. Yes. And how did that change d what you were doing? Well, one what thing that was really interesting uh, is that back when I, as an aside, mm -hmm. when I was applying for the branch chief position, there were, I think, seven of us applying for five positions. Now, um, and it changed even before they, we had the sort of um, restructuring where branch chiefs went away and they, and assistant directors. Now there's like 40 people applying for three positions. Um, so my chances were a lot better <laughs> back then than they would have ever been now. Um, so I'm, I'm a branch chief, right? I had done whatever investigations I had done. The first thing I did when I met with people um, was sort of say, look, I need your help. Um, I've been here for this long. Uh, you've been here for 20 years. 
I haven't done nearly as much as you've done. You're talking about the staff, staff attorneys, attorneys under you. Yeah. Who, okay. Some of them have been there for 20 years. Some of them have been there for three or four. You know, it, okay. uh, it all depended. Um, but I felt, at least for me, the best approach was to come in and just be transparent. I've done this stuff. I haven't done that stuff. We're going to figure it out together. I hope, you know, that, you know, even though I've only been here X amount of time and mm -hmm. you've been here longer, or you may have applied for the job that I got, right? Because that happened all the time. Um, you know, let's work together. Let's bring good cases. Help me learn. I'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go forward and we'll do so. Early on, uh, you know, you have to adjust your, your focus because while you're responsible as the branch chief, mm -hmm. Ultimately, for the matter and the matter getting done right, you also are in a supervisory role. So you can't take the lead um, on everything. You have to train and help people grow and develop as, as attorneys. So, um, you know, you're and you're off, and now you're, you know, reporting to, uh, you know, an assistant director who has, again, a breadth and depth of experience that, you know, you don't have. And I was so fortunate to work under Jerry Eisenberg as my um, assistant director, who was just, you know, crazy smart, um, sensible, uh, and uh, very, you know, just uh, just a tremendous person, too. Um, and so, um, so, you know, you have that different change in scope and focus as a branch chief. Okay. So I want to move on. A little bit before I do, a lot of the sometimes the easy people to study or the easy people to learn about are those who are directors or those who are chair of the commission. And I'm curious if there are individuals who really struck stuck in your memory. You already mentioned Kevin O'Rourke uh, as really contributing a lot as very memorable individuals who, w while you were during yeah. this period at the commission. So there's one person um, that I worked with as a staff attorney who really taught me a lot about how to investigate and how to ask questions. And her name was Shelly Grant. Um, um, Shelly was a tough, tough person. Uh, very demanding, high expectations. Um, I still remember we, we interviewed somebody one afternoon and she's like, we're getting on the plane now. We're flying out. We're going to lock him in you know, tomorrow in testimony. It's like, whatever you say, Shelly, let's do it. Um, I remember asking questions, uh, and she didn't like the questions that I was asking, and she started kicking me and kicking me hard under the table while I was asking the questions. Uh, she never backed down. Her questions were really sharp. Um, so she's someone in particular, at least in terms of sort of giving me, you know, helping me from an investigative standpoint. I, I, I do think of, of her a lot. Uh, Jerry, uh, f uh, you know, as a as a supervisor, yeah, who I work, Eisenberg, Eisenberg, who I work so closely with, um, just for always thinking about doing the right thing, and and to and to investigating cases that made sense to investigate. I, J Jerry was just terrific at sort of always asking the question like, why are we doing this? Does this make sense to do? Okay. And and just having a, a tremendous sense of sort of, you know, we have to make sure we're, we're, you know, we're feeling good about what we do. Okay. So obviously during your time, leadership changed as it inevitably does. So early on you worked first for the, the first director you would have worked under would be Bill McLucas, succeeded by Dick Walker in 1998. And we can get to the individuals who then succeeded them a little later. But I'm curious, from your perspective, what did it, how did it change at the top of the division change the work you did changed the tone of the Division of Enforcement. Right. So, uh, you know, I was a supervisor for a little, for just, a, I think, a couple years when, um, you know, Bill was there. Um, my interactions with Bill when I was a staff attorney were primarily, you know, we worked out in the gym at the same time, and so we kind of got to know each other uh, in that way. Uh, because we, and I did get to know him. Mm -hmm. As a supervisor uh, and as a branch chief, I didn't have as direct contact with him as, say, the assistant or the associate. But I remember we'd have these big, huge, you know, sort of Monday meetings as supervisors and, you know, go around the table, try to figure out what the, you know, sort of issues were going to be for the week or the coming weeks. 
Um, and, uh, you know, Bill, you know, was always very direct uh, and um, very, you know, pragmatic and mm -hmm. smart, down to earth, very easy to relate to. Uh, always kind of like, you know, had this rubbing his face kind of thing when he'd ever feel like, you know, the pressure was, uh, was coming. So, um, so those are kind of my memories of him. But, but always, when I think of Bill, I just sort of think about somebody who's just sort of no nonsense, whatever it is, let's just get it done and, and move forward and, and stay aggressive, uh, in, you know. Um, Dick uh, was somebody who I think of as sort of always being bright and positive, um, who was, you know, enthusiasm sort of just coming out of his pores. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I remember sort of, you know, I think under him, we, I just remember doing a lot more sort of sweeps and internet related sweeps, mm -hmm. uh, pump and dump uh, promoter cases. Uh, the idea of trying to um, sort of have a big impact in an area where you could do 10,000 cases. You'd never stop doing these cases. The idea being, let's bring, you know, a bunch of them and see if we could extinguish conduct or affect conduct far and wide by bringing a whole bunch and being impactful and, and hopefully um, sort of deterring things. So, you know, that was a way to sort of leverage the, you know, the, the resources that we had to try to maximize the message. Mm -hmm. So was the idea of a sweep to hit some of the worst actors or to get a lot of media coverage that would scare people away? So um, it, I think it was really the latter. Okay. It's certainly in the areas of sort of, um, you know, kind of the pump and dump, the promoter kinds of cases, um, because there are just so many of them. Sure. The idea was to sort of say, look, we could do this many, do them fast, and watch out. We could come after you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it was not necessarily about, at that time, trying to, you know, go and find, you know, two, three sort of high-profile uh, entities and pursue them. Also in this, in this period in the late 90s, there were certainly media reports at the time uh, that increasing numbers of people would be leaving the Division of Enforcement, frankly because the division paid, this, the law market was booming, the internet economy was booming, because the rewards outside of the commission were so great that, they, that there was really a lot of turnover and there was some discussion of morale. What was your impression being there? Um, so certainly remember that that was happening. Uh, and I think everybody was in their own particular situation or circumstance. Um, you know, um, I don't know if at the time, I don't think, um, at some point I got married and I had two young <laughs> kids. Uh, my wife worked as well. Um, and so, you know, we were able to do just fine. You know, at some point, the SEC pay scale was adjusted and, uh, you know, we uh, at the SEC made, you know, uh, had salaries that were much more, um, you know, higher than other sort of GS, you know, uh, uh, government employees. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was a way to try to address the, um, you know, the sort of uh, the retention issue to try to keep people there and not lose, you know, quality, capable people. Uh, so it certainly affected, uh, you know, folks. Uh, I think it got addressed to some degree. Um, I don't remember it crippling or having a crippling effect, but it certainly was an issue. Okay. So I'd like to move on a little to sort of the 2000s when you rose up in the, uh, uh, rose up in the division. And at some point, I want to turn to the cases you were involved with, but I want to preliminarily talk about sort of some, some questions about the roles you played and about the structure of the division mm -hmm. and the commission. So in 2000, you became an assistant director. Right. And what did that actually mean? What did it entail to become right. an assistant director and your responsibilities? Sure. So as an assistant director, you supervised, um, it, and it depended on sort of how it was constituted, three or four branches. Okay. So you had three or four branch chiefs reporting to you. So a branch back then could have anywhere uh, from three to four staff attorneys and a branch chief. So basically, you know, I ended up supervising, you know, three or four branch chiefs and a total of somewhere around 14 or 15, 16 staff attorneys. Mm -hmm. So um, the work 
um, changed because I was no longer having day-to-day -day responsibility for the running of cases. The branch chiefs were, were doing that. And so they were providing the direct supervision and training and the like. Um, I became more involved, you know, with sort of the overall scope, direction, planning, um, as, um, you know, moving things along, uh, interfacing with the associate director who had greater contact with the front office and the commission. And so um, it ended up being far more supervisory, mm -hmm. less hands-on, uh, and uh, you know, more, uh, more memos to read, uh, more things to move along, and ultimately now um, becoming more involved in the negotiation of the resolution of cases. Um, as a branch chief, you know, my role was to sort of assist with the assistant director and the associate in doing that. But now when cases were coming to an end and they were being, you know, the wells were being discussed and the resolution was on the table, um, the assistants and the associates were playing a, a, a greater role. Okay, so I think you already answered some of this question, but I am curious. So to what extent would you actually, so before negotiation, would you find yourself very involved in a case? Would you just be loosely keeping an eye over a staff attorney handling a particular matter? Um, I would say I was mostly interfacing with the branch chiefs, but okay. the branch chiefs would come in and we'd report, they'd report on the cases they were doing and investigating. Um, you know, for me, my first sort of, I don't want to say first because it, 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 no case should have gotten to my desk with me knowing nothing about it. I would know things about it, but really the memo would come and it was really, for me, uh, the biggest challenge was trying to look at the memo and appreciate what the evidence really was. And when you say the memo, is that after the a formal? action memo? The action. Yeah. So I apologize. So when the when the division of enforcement is going to make a recommendation, what it does is prepare a memo that sort of summarizes what the facts are. Uh, analyzes the law with the facts and then recommends sort of how to what the proceeding should be and so the action memo was you know a document that was you know 10 to 20 25 pages that basically laid out the evidence and so because you're the assistant and not the branch chief you're not in testimony you're not reviewing the documents and so that document is several steps removed from what has actually happened and so those were things that the assistants read and um, for me it was sort of the, uh, the a significant point in the investigation where I had to try to appreciate how strong is the evidence, uh, have we assessed the evidence correctly, uh, how strong a case is it given what we have to prove mm -hmm. and so the action memo process and review ended up being a fairly critical piece of the job. Just because I'm curious about the process, was there ever a point where you would get an action memo and say we're not going to proceed with it or was it just your job to strengthen what was um, going on? You know, it, generally speaking, um, for it to progress to that point, um, you, were, you were, should know enough about the case to say we're bringing something. What might change would be that uh, let's say you were you had been investigating and there were you know four individuals that you thought an action ought to be brought against you may look at it and say you know I think we're there with two of them but I don't think we're there on the other two okay. that could change or you know I don't think this charge is one we should include or we've sufficiently supported so we shouldn't go with that those are the kinds of things that could happen but it was um, I don't, I'm not sure I remember a situation where, you know, I got something that was an action and I, you know, I killed it at that point. Those kinds of things happened as a result of the Wells process uh, where, in fact, we did back off of bringing something or changed it because of the Wells process. Okay, and then you became an associate director in 06. Yes. And what did that, and how did that change from being an assistant director? So, you know, from there you go to having, you know, three assistant director groups under you. So you've now got, you know, 
45 to 50 people who report to you. Uh, and, um, you know, there you're, you're trying to figure out, um, you know, from a group perspective, um, how the cases are proceeding, making sure they're moving along, um, you know, making sure that you let your good people do their jobs and mm -hmm. and not get in the way and uh, spend your time and attention where necessary if you've got folks who uh, need the help. Uh, so um, so there was that, but really, at, you know, at least you know from the associate job, you're much closer, much more closely connected to the deputy director, director, uh, and the commission. So you, again, you're involved in resolving cases, but you're more involved in um, uh, getting cases through the commission, uh, presenting at commission meetings, really assisting the director in deciding, you know, uh, policy, policy initiatives, operational matters for the division, you know, those kinds of things. Before we go on, did you like the supervisory jobs as opposed to being a staff attorney? So I found that with every promotion I got, I moved a little further away from what I uh, honestly okay. thought was I was best at. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, look, I enjoy working with people <laughs> and uh, we brought a lot of great cases um, and I, you know, ultimately think I was pretty good at my job. Um, but when I think about, you know, all of the skills, all of the responsibilities, I think that, you know, the staff attorney branch chief jobs were the most fun um, because of the nature of the, of the work. That, at least that was true for me. Okay. And obviously in these roles that you had other directors of enforcement you worked with, first Steve Cutler, then Linda Thompson, and then towards the end of your time, uh, Rob Kuzami. So as you got closer to those individuals, how did the change? Well, first of all, I should ask what your impression of each of them was. Sure. And then as well, how did perhaps a new director of enforcement change your work or change the direction of the division? Right. So Steve came in, uh, and I had had Steve in a, a case before he was director. And so I knew him from... Um, from that experience. I'm sorry, when he was other side of the table? Or who's Wilmer, deputy? he was at Wilmer. Okay. Yeah, so he was, uh, he was at Wilmer, and I can't remember what the exact issue was in the case, um, but I just remember thinking, oh, you know, we, we got this one, right? And he came in and I realized, you know, that he, there was stuff we didn't know and didn't appreciate. So. I knew he was a very capable lawyer, smart guy, um, and uh, so when Steve came in, had a lot of interaction with him because at the time I was, you know, further up in the up in the chain, there were a lot of financial fraud cases that I was bringing. Uh, Steve was pretty hands-on, um, accessible, uh, very deliberate, thoughtful, super smart, aggressive. Um, you know, it, you know, was sort of. In that period of time, I think, you know, when he came in, it was sort of Sarbanes-Oxley, post-Enron, all that sort of, you know, time. And uh, I just had a lot of respect for, for Steve. He was very relatable um, and, uh, you know, he uh, funny um, uh, as well. Uh, so under him, he had a terrific relationship with the chair uh, at the time. So uh, all around just terrific things. Um, you know, Linda was, had been working for Steve, um, and, and I had grown to know Linda well. Uh, I reported to Linda. She made me uh, an associate under her, and um, we had a terrific partnership and relationship. Um, so, uh, you know, she was more hands-off, uh, I think, hopefully reflecting that there was uh, you know, some degree of trust sure. there that we'd get things uh, right. Um, uh, the other associate that I, you know, was reporting to Linda at the time, who's mm -hmm. now passed away, is Scott Freestad. Uh, uh, Scott, uh, my career and Scott's career were sort of uh, running in parallel. Like, I, he got an assistant job and then I got one. He got the associate job and then I got one. And 
we were very close and, you know, we'd uh, um, talk to one another a lot about our cases. And, um, and so, um, you know, Linda uh, was, I always remember Linda was terrific um, at working the room when it came time to come in uh, and, um, you know, uh, uh, you got opposing counsel. Uh, again, Linda was not as involved necessarily in the cases, but she'd come in as if she knew everything. Um, and I think maybe her experience as an AUSA, you know, led her to be able to think on her feet and move and work in the room really well. So she was terrific at advocating, um, you know, in those group settings and uh, making everybody, you know, uh, believe she knew everything, even though she, uh, and I don't mean this as a slight, knew, knew, didn't know nearly as, as much as she may have let on, but she did a terrific job. You know, Rob came in and, you know, he came on, he came in under entirely uh, unique yes. uh, circumstances. And, uh, you know, Rob um, had a mandate uh, to bring about change and, uh, you know, was able to execute on on that because it was you know I think fairly you know fairly stated at that point the division uh, was in a really you know bad place the commission was generally post Madoff and mm -hmm. uh, so he brought about a lot of reforms uh, that were necessary so just sort of turn the division around to a place where um, if we didn't do it it was going to get done to us. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that's sort of, at least in my part, because I was only there for a couple of years with him, that's sort of how I think of him um, and the important the significance to the division. And in discussing them, obviously, you mentioned Enron, you mentioned Madoff, so certainly, and Sarbanes-Oxley in the aftermath, so some of what the division is doing is inevitably dictated by outside developments. Correct. Did you have a sense that any of the directors had their own, that being said, still had their own particular interests, their own initiatives they might have wanted to, uh, concerns they wanted enforcement to focus yeah. its resources on? I, you know, I, when I think of Steve, I think of gatekeepers. I think that became a real emphasis, again, on the issue of resources. Um, if you hold gate, if you bring cases against gatekeepers, then all the gatekeepers throughout the industries pick their heads up, right? So if you bring cases that involve compliance officers, CFOs, you know, accountants, you're affecting an entire industry um, in ways that, um, you know, allows you to be effective without bringing 100 cases. So the gatekeeper focus was one I think, and I, uh, I think, you know, whether it was Steve's idea or one that was developed, but I think, I think of Steve in that regard. Um, you know, Linda um, had, you know, a number of different things occur on her watch, but, you know, uh, there it was just a function of, you know, for example, options backdating just sort of exploding, right? And yeah. so you got to figure out how to, you know, manage that stuff. And Rob, in, you know, came in and inherited the financial crisis. And uh, so, um, but I, you know, I think Rob ushered in, you know, an effort to sort of turn uh, the enforcement division uh, again with the idea of try to maximizing, you know, and leveraging uh, the limited resources with all the cooperation tools and the cooperation program, trying to encourage and incentivize people to come in uh, with the whistleblower program. Again, incentivizing people to come in with high quality. Uh, leads, tips, and referrals so that you could bring impactful cases and hopefully do so more quickly. Okay. Um, let me actually jump ahead. I want to return in a minute to, to this period of time. From the where you sit now, which is being in private practice for a number of years, has all the incentive towards self-reporting, the whistleblower, changed the behavior of individuals or c issuers, companies, a range of entities sure. that are concerned about enforcement? So, uh, yeah, um, you know, being on this side, um, you know, there, there's, you know, enormous compliance, you know, uh, uh, the apparatus that have built up, and you know, certainly within financial institutions, there's been, you know, greater, you know, attention being 
uh, placed uh, around compliance and regulated entities. You've got tremendous resources, you know, around internal controls. Uh, all of these things are intended to kind of like catch things and keep things from becoming becoming problems. Um, but um, you know, there's still a you know a raging debate over you know. Uh, the benefits of self-reporting uh, if you're an issuer, um, you know, and, and, you know, I think, you know, most practitioners constantly weigh the question over, you know, if I do an investigation, I look at the following things and I think I've got it pretty well assessed, do I, you know, nevertheless run into the government and next thing you know, you know, uh, because I'm afraid that I will be penalized for not self-reporting, will that be understood? Will I suffer repercussions? You know, will the issuers have consequences to them? So I think that, you know, that debate rages on um, uh, to, this, to this day. All the, all the incentives that were put in place to self-report uh, still are things that are challenging aspects in private practice. Okay, so going back a bit, um, by the time you said you were assistant associate director, you're getting more exposure, perhaps spending more time presenting to the commission itself. And I'm curious how the changes in the commission, especially changes in the chair, from Levitt to Harvey Pitt, Donaldson, you know, fill out the list. Uh, did you have a sense that that changed the work enforcement was doing? Or how did that impinge sure. on what you were doing? Sure. Um, you know, I think um, there was a period of time um, you know, after Donaldson left and, you know, Pitt came, uh, uh, Chairman Pitt was there for a, a shorter period of time. Um, but under, you know, uh, uh, Chris Cox, um, you know, there, I think, were increasing reports, um, particularly around sort of issues of sort of uh, penalties and pe issuer penalties. Mm -hmm. It's always been a long and, you know, a principled debate over, you know, should public companies be penalized when the harm is really, you know, the, pe the penalty really just ends up harming shareholders who have already been harmed by the conduct of the folks. Right? So there's, there are principled reasons for questioning you know penalties, mm -hmm. um, but um, but I think there was you know some uh, concerns certainly that were echoed outside of the building uh, about whether or not um, the enforcement you know division issuer penalties were um, you know uh, undergoing a little more scrutiny and you know if there were some efforts to sort of pump the brakes if you will a little bit on. Uh, on enforcement, so um, I think we felt a little bit of that in the division, um, you know, at at the time, um, uh, for a few a few years, um, but uh, you know, then um, you know those things. Uh, I think it was at the same time, though, you know, uh, to to be completely, uh, you know, f fulsome. Um, Every commission is pro enforcement, and so uh, you know, bringing cases, bringing good cases, bringing them quickly, all of, you know, those things were always embodied in you know in the, the commission's you know um, you know uh, mandate in it in its work. It's uh, but I you know I think some aspects of the program may have gotten a little more attention and and may have been like I said sort of the brakes might have been pumped a little bit. Um, actually, just looking back over a lot of things you did in enforcement, there must have been moments where an attorney, for instance, wanted to bring a matter and ultimately was told it was, was not able to do that or the commission chose to take a different route or someone before the commission. How do, you, how do you respond when you've spent a significant time on a matter and it doesn't pan out? Right. Um, so it's challenging. I had a matter uh, like that. Uh, as well, uh, when I was a staff attorney, I spent a tremendous amount of time um, investigating it, uh, and it didn't move forward for various reasons. Um, 
and uh, telling people, you know, tell, hearing that they weren't going to bring it, you know, was was tough. Um, you know, the you hope that if you're supervising cases appropriately, that you don't get to the point uh, that uh, you decide a matter in its entirety isn't going to get brought, meaning it's already gone through the full investigation, an action memo, you know, brought up to, you know, be circulated internally in the building before it goes to the commission and saying, no, we're not doing it. So that's, it's really hard, um, but sometimes things have emerged uh, in the process and it's evident that, you know, maybe the investigation wasn't done the right way, maybe, uh, you know, and in, in further investigation wouldn't change, you know, further investigation wouldn't overcome, you know, the evidence that you were now seeing that, you know, maybe through the Wells process you hadn't seen before. So it's tough. Um, there's no easy way to say sorry. Okay. So actually, we now want to turn back to some of the cases you did work on as assistant associate director. So you mentioned Enron, and I know you didn't work on Enron, but immediately after that, there were a series of explosions in major American companies. Uh, lots of allegations of accounting fraud, and I know you worked on some major accounting fraud cases, and I wonder if you could talk about one or two of those. Sure. Um, I, uh, two that come to mind, um, I worked on a, uh, a case involving ConAgra, okay. um, which involved both revenue recognition issues and the misuse of reserves. Um, Bill McLucas was actually on the other side of that case. Um, and one of the biggest challenges in that time period were sort of the issues of penalties. Uh, what penalties make sense? You had enormous penalties in cases involving financial fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you determine what the right number is? You know, there was penalty guidance. Uh, eventually there was a pilot program that the commission um, uh, created which uh, had the commission determine whether there would be a penalty in an issue or case and and then what that penalty would be and I one of my cases was that was the fir the first case to go through the you know the penal the pilot penalty program where the commission actually uh, uh, determined a range for the penalty um, and sort of set the negotiating parameters Typically in the process, it was a division of enforcement that would negotiate the penalty, bring it to the commission as a recommendation. At that point, there was little, well, the commission could always do what it wanted, but if the penalty was $50 million, asking for more uh, or cha making it less was a challenge. Um, so, um, so Conagra was one of those. Uh, Cardinal Health was another one that I worked on where um, they, uh, by virtue of uh, letting uh, certain uh, products sit on the dock for 24 hours and a minute, uh, it suddenly became operating revenue, which mattered, <laughs> uh, versus bulk revenue, which everybody ignored. Um, so, you know, those two cases ended up, you know, ConAgra I think was 35 million, uh, ConAgra was 40 million. Uh, we did Nortel as well which I think was, you know, 25, 35, I can't remember the number. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were big numbers. And, uh, you know, um, again, it, you know, those kinds of things were getting a lot of attention. Later on, as an associate, you know, we brought Dell, which was a yes. sort of disclosure-related uh, case around, um, a around um, certain, um, suddenly escaping the word, um, exclusivity payments, you know, Dell didn't uh, want, um, wanted, uh, uh, Intel was paying Dell for utilizing its Intel chips, didn't want them to move to AMD, but those became increasingly necessary and dependent for Dell to make its uh, operating um, income, and that really wasn't being disclosed. That ended up being $100 million, right? So that was a big number yes. as well. I don't think, you know, these days outside of FCPA cases, there aren't big issuer cases that have those kinds of penalties, at least I don't think. Any idea why not? <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. Well, I, I just think the, you know, the, first of all, there certainly aren't the level and degree of 
financial fraud cases that there okay. used to be. Um, you know, whether that means the cases have, have uh, whether those issues have been solved or, or gone underground, I'm not quite, quite sure. Mm -hmm. But it's been many, many years now where the sort of rampant frauds, and I, I think you have to just chalk it up to, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and internal controls and auditors who themselves got, uh, you know, uh, had s significant liability exposure. And, and so, um, but uh, I just think, you know, um, you know the the the, situ the circumstances with the commission uh, are just such that you know big issue or penalty cases are not the kinds of cases that that um, are they're sort of have an appetite for. Okay, and I guess mo moving on to perhaps moving back, there were also a series of cases I understand you worked on about I IPO allocation in the in the year two thousand the incredible bubbles with one incomprehensible company after another. Yeah. Um, you know, that was where, you know, anybody had an idea, you know, they scribbled out on a piece of paper, and next thing you know, they, you know, had a, you know, uh, you know, a $500 million valuation, you know, mm -hmm. things were going crazy. Um, so, yeah, in the IPO market, you know, back in the day, you know, you'd have these IPOs going off, but then, you know, the within five, ten you know, days, you know, the aftermarket for those cases, the stock price and the aftermarket of those, you know, newly uh, public companies are just through the roof. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we looked at a, a number of the practices that were going on. Uh, we ended up bringing a case against J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley um, based on sort of the same kind of conduct, which was inducing or attempting to induce um, those who were getting IPO allocations mm -hmm. in, to make um, purchases in the aftermarket. You know, basically the idea is the aftermarket ought to reflect the true, you know, sort of, you know, supply and demand as opposed to having some inducements for people to step in. And so um, the, we, at the time, you know, alleged that the Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, had essentially given IPO allocations to firms who were going to come in and come in at increasingly higher prices. Roberts and Stevens was another one where the, the, the practice was that to get IPO allocations, the, um, the, the, the basically hedge funds at the time would agree to do um, uh, trades in highly liquid exchange traded stocks at, at significantly higher commission rates than would normally you could you know instead of doing six cents you're paying two dollars and fifty cents and though they would be sharing in the IPO profits mm -hmm. through that practice. So Roberts, the Roberts, Roberts and Stevens, and Stevens a yeah basically. was a commit was a commission case yeah um, you know it was a brand new area uh, you know was uh, I think fairly uh, labeled as enforcement you know regulation through enforcement mm -hmm. but there was a rule Reg M 101 that had not been you know, enforced in any way uh, up to that time. But exactly what conduct would violate Reg M, um, there hadn't been any cases and, and there weren't any, you know, guidelines. Uh, but the rule was was uh, pretty clear in terms of its, you know, the conceptual, um, you know, what the nature of the violations would be. Mm -hmm. But those were very difficult, contentious, challenging um, uh, negotiations uh, and, um, you know, we were, I still remember sort of being, you know, uh, you couldn't be further apart when we called and said, we want X, and, um, and they said, okay, we'll give you Y, and think of the two biggest numbers, th think <laughs> of the biggest difference between two numbers, and, and that's sort of where it started. And this is because of the, the law never having really been applied before, so they felt it was unjust to suddenly... Or did they just think they hadn't done anything wrong, period? I think it was that, plus it was just a function of um, the, the firm, the law firm, the nature of it. Um, you know, there were, uh, there were uh, you know, challenges in these cases. Um, the cases also brought uh, other cases that involved um, firms being sued for their email practices. and and uh, the productions and retention of emails. And so, um, 
some of the firms had issues there that affected um, some of the investigations that were going on. So just a, just a challenging environment and uh, pretty aggressive lawyering. So, and actually you bring up something. So regulation through enforcement uh, is a term that is sometimes used to describe what's sometimes perhaps more prejudicial. I believe Commissioner Carmel in her day viewed it as a way of criticizing it. How would you describe because you, you just sort of used it in a pretty, <coughs> neutral, a pretty neutral or descriptive way. Did you yeah. think that was a fair characterization of what you were up to? Well, I think it was fair to raise the question, okay. but in the sense that there, the contours of what was or wasn't prohibited by the rule hadn't been really fleshed out, but there was a rule. Okay. And the rule said you can't induce, you know, aftermarket activity. And so the fact that there hadn't been a case before didn't, necess didn't mean you couldn't bring one. Okay. You know, there was a, a lot of argument around what are the standards. Because, look, it was, we were very engaged with Corp Fin uh, and, um, at the time, you know, Market Reg, because we didn't want to, you know, um, st stamp, out the IPO markets and practices. So we didn't want to suddenly, you know, make uh, conduct that was appropriately part of the capital formation IPO process suddenly, you know, impede that. Okay. So uh, we worked very closely with Alan Beller at the time. Um, Alan had tremendous respect in, you know, in the industry based on his, you know, his, his the practice that he had before coming to the SEC. Um, and so, when, and we picked things that, uh, we identified things in the practices that really were, you know, uh, at least in our view and, and certainly Corfin's view, um, outside of what would be normally expected to occur between, you know, a, you know, a firm and, uh, and an entity that was seeking to uh, subscribe in an IPO. Okay. So, and actually, I want to in a second. I want to ask about options backdating, which also occurred at the time. But if I can, was it unusual for enforcement to work that closely with Corp Fin and the other divisions, or was that something that was that it occurred more regularly during your time? So, um, the typical case, uh, enforcement case, um, always ultimately ran its way through the other divisions and and, and offices. It, to the extent that those rules were implicated. So if it was a Section 5 case, Corp Fin had to, you know, review it and pass on it. If it was a, you know, if it was a application of a, you know, an I, I, IA rule or an IM rule, they had to review and be comfortable with it. Frequently in enforcement, you brought um, those folks on sooner rather than later. Last thing in the world you want to do is to do an investigation have it circulate in the building and have somebody from investment management or investment, you know, or, you know, uh, investment management say, mm -hmm. you know, this is not a violation or, <laughs> you know, you didn't do it right. There's no evidence, right? So, so you, you did engage with, with folks early. Um, that was a little bit unique, though, because um, it was the application of a rule for the first time and it got uh, a level of attention um, that was significant. And then Corp Fin, in fact, came out with guidance or rules, uh, you know, after that that helped flesh things out. So um, that was unusual because of the nature of it, but it wasn't unusual to um, to work with other offices and divisions. Okay. So another matter you worked on was the options backdating matter, which um, I guess 2003 would have been. I'm not, I can't remember. It's hard the exact to remember data, exactly when but that whole. It very, it very quickly turned out that a great many companies were implicated in options backdating. Yeah. And so I'm a little curious about sort of both the matters you handled, and frankly, this may be another question of how does the SEC use its resources when a huge number of potential uh, matters are out there. Right. Um, that was a a. Um, that was a, I don't know if to call it a crisis or a scandal or whatever the right word is. I'm not sure either of those were right. But when the whole options backdating thing um, hit, um, as you said, it, it you know, potentially implicated hundreds, if 
not thousands of companies. The commission very early on, and I think appropriately so, had to figure out what are the parameters around these cases. Um, the commission was involved, Linda was involved at the time. Um, I did a lot of these. It was an, actually an options backdating group, uh, working group. We kept track of the inventory. We kept track of factors. Inventory meaning? The case. cases that were under investigation and any new cases had to be assessed against sort of a matrix of, of facts um, and factors. And if they didn't appear to, you know, uh, satisfy the factors, the idea was to sort of shut those down pretty quickly. So there, there had to have essentially been some element of sort of falsification and fraud um, that had occurred um, in connection with the activity. So, you know, I did um, Converse, uh, which was um, very interest, very sort of significant because it was a criminal matter uh, at the time. A number of these cases did Im involve criminal matters. Um, and uh, the gentleman who uh, had uh, the CEO of the company was supposed to surrender himself and he never showed up and he ran off to Namibia. And uh, I've always felt that that gave this practice um, certain attention and notoriety that, you know, at the time there was this raging debate of whether there was anything illegal or wrong about it. And when a guy doesn't, when the guy flees to Namibia, it gets a lot of attention. Um, we also brought a case in this area which was unique and significant. We actually um, uh, brought a case against outside directors for their uh, role in um, the options uh, approval process. You know, outside directors are, you know, sit in a very different uh, position versus inside directors. Sure. Um, so their knowledge, awareness, participation can be limited. But again, they, we brought a recklessness case against um, uh, these outside directors um, based on, you know, the information that had come to their attention which made, which essentially the argument was, the allegations were that they were reckless in not knowing that, you know, uh, the options had been backdated in a way that was essentially fraudulent. Um, and so um, that was another, another case that we brought. Okay. So options backdating, obviously, a lot of, the matrix, I think you mentioned, it's very interesting. I haven't heard that before. How did, especially, I guess, the assistant associate director, when you chose which cases or as helped discuss which chase cases to pursue, how, did, how would you divide perhaps resources between cases that appear to be fairly straightforward, fairly manageable, and cases that might appear as though they would require much more resources from the staff and perhaps uh, take a much longer time to reach resolution? Um, you know, I think when it came to assigning work and, um, you know, it, it, I don't want to say it was a sort of you eat what you kill kind of mentality, but you know the, di the division moved away ultimately through sort of specialized groups and tried to be, you know, think differently about the cases that were brought and the resources, resources that would be assigned. Back then it was if you identified the case, it was yours, whether it was with, you know, at the time the best staff attorneys and the best supervisors in the group, or it was with people that were, you know, instead of being the best, they were they were terrific, but not the best, right? Okay. Um, you know, um, we didn't really move a lot of things around back then. So if people had time to work on things, um, you'd assign them to, you know, to the cases. Uh, the idea was that they should be able to do any kind of case. Uh, again, not saying that was the smartest thing to do, but it was the way we typically did things. Um, and so you kind of relied on the experience of the branch chief, the experience of the assistant director to be able to know how an investigation should be done. Um, and so, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't necessarily pull the people who had the most experience doing certain kinds of things or pull somebody off of something uh, that was really good at it and tell them, look, I need you to 
work on this thing and not that thing. I'm going to give you so um, it it was um, it it was probably you know more or less kind of catch as catch can. Okay. Um, I want to ask about one other matter you worked on at this time, which I gather was the uh, Collins and Aikman, David Stockman case, and how that came about and what your role was in it. Sure. Um, so again, that was another financial fraud case. Um, my memory, you know, is that it involved sort of round-trip transactions and rebates and the like. Um, it's a case that was brought criminally, but very soon thereafter had to be dismissed. Um, because of issues in the in the case, uh, we brought um, a case against David Stockman and other individuals, and I think we ultimately resolved those cases. Uh, it's a funny story about being in a meeting uh, with a whole bunch of lawyers representing David Stockman, um, and it happened to involve the you know the Morvillo Abramowitz firm. I, I kid you not, I think there were 12 lawyers sitting around the table. It was probably the most expensive meeting I ever witnessed as an as a attorney at the SEC, you know, with the lawyers on the other side. But all the attorneys from Morvillo Abramowitz were, rep, were you know, introducing themselves, saying, I'm, you know, I'm so-and-so from the Morvillo firm, I'm so-and-so from the Morvillo firm, and Elkin Abramowitz, who was there, uh, you know, I think by the time it got to him, everybody appreciated what had been said. Uh, so Elkin Abrama would say, I'm Elkin Abrama, so I'm from the Morvillo firm too, <laughs> even though, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, he was, uh, he's one of the name partners, but he gave in and said he was from the Morvillo firm. So <laughs> that was a funny story. I'm sorry, I just realized there are one or two more matters I wanted to ask about, uh, one of which was your work on insider trading cases okay. at this time. And I guess insider trading cases seem to be, they're, they're they're matters that show up for a brief time and are very important, and then they fade, and then they're kind of perennial matters. And insider trader seems to be a perennial matter. Yeah. Um, those were always fun cases to do. Um, it was about reconstructing somebody's life, trying to figure out where they were, when they were somewhere, you know, how the information got to them. You know, I, I liked doing insider trading cases, again, sort of as I sort of described myself earlier. Um, you know, brought some cases against, um, you know, some institutional cases, you know, sort of folks that were working at financial institutions who acquired information and engaged in trading. Um, I brought a case a bunch with, that involved a bunch of brokers who uh, found out about a potential acquisition. One of the funny, they were on tape. And one of the funny things they did was uh, because of the industry they were in, they went out and bought chickens and put them in the front yard of the of somebody who had also traded and they were very excited about you know having made money um, I did a case that involved a, an analyst at, at S&P who um, uh, was passing along rating information um, and uh, you know a matter that involved an individual who was a lawyer at a law firm who was passing tips on potential M&A activity to, uh, to a friend, and they were engaging in all sorts of trading activity. Um, you know, the one case that was sort of an interesting twist on the sort of traditional insider trading case involved hacking. Um, and uh, there was a, a TRO that we brought because there had been an intrusion into a Thomson Reuters uh, site that was hosting earnings information for an issuer and uh, somebody had been able, someone had gained access through hacking uh, to the information that was going to be disclosed in an earnings call later that day or a day later. Uh, did a whole bunch of trading and was poised to make a lot of money but we were able to, to freeze the assets. So it was a very interesting situation because when we brought the case, the district court said, well, I look at this as insider trading and there's no, been no breach of duty. All the person did was, you know, you know, gain access, but it, it's, there's no duty here. And uh, so we were able to go to the Second Circuit and got it reversed on the grounds that 10B is a fraud statute 
deception uh, had occurred because in order for the uh, outside entity to have gained access to the material, as we argued, they had deceived the, you know, the, the host into thinking that they rightly belong, they rightly had access to the material. And so the hacking with that form of deception was covered um, you know, by, you know, by 10B. And so, you know, they reversed, uh, you know, and, uh, and you know, the, the case went, went forward. But it was, uh, it was a very early indication well before uh, these kinds of intrusions were occurring that they were possible. I remember we, you know, we spoke to the Justice Department about that and they dedicated resources to, to begin to look at those things. But it was kind of a, a precursor, if you will, to, uh, to uh, the kinds of things that nowadays with are, intrusions happen all common. the time. Yeah. Right. Let's ask about the financial crisis because that seemed to change a lot of things. And obviously for the SEC, what was particularly significant was the Madoff scandal. Right. So my first question is, when the Madoff scandal broke, what was the reaction within the enforcement division to that particular piece of news? Sure. Um, so using words that I, that weren't the words that everybody used at the time. Look, it was a it was a bad, you know, a very bad and unfortunate um, and embarrassing situation. Um, and uh, so the division, you know, very quickly and look rightly so came under scrutiny. Uh, a lot of attention uh, was uh, was paid to you know what happened how things uh, unfolded, were things missed, if things were missed, how come and why. And, you know, like I didn't follow the ins and outs of, of that. I, and I appreciated that people were well-intentioned and hardworking. I don't, you know, I didn't, I, to this day, I don't know exactly, okay. um, you know, kind of if they were failures, what, what they were and, 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 and how come they occurred. But, the it, you know the it was very very clear given the immensity of the harm and the issues in terms of the investigations that uh, you know division was you know kind of on I don't want to say life support but the commission was really rocked um, it was really difficult you know having been in a place for so many years where you said you worked at the SEC and everybody thought like well that's great and you've done this and you've done that now you said you were from the SEC and People got angry, uh, and understandably so. So uh, you know that was a really difficult, challenging time, morale-wise. Um, and then with the financial crisis, and uh, you know, concerns there about you know whether the commission and you know, enforcement division had done enough, if they were on top of things enough, you know, those kinds of things. How come we, you know, at the time they hadn't spotted it or were investigating mm -hmm. cases? So, you know, those things kind of happened and it, you know, uh, reforms, you know, needed to be made. Um, if the division didn't take care of it, they would be taken care of by, uh, you know, outside forces. So, um, you know, there was an opportunity to uh, institute changes uh, that came in under Rob that were designed to, you know, make the enforcement division, you know, uh, more specialized, uh, smarter, uh, more efficient, uh, you know, some of the positions, you know, there was a, you know, move away from branch chiefs to assistant directors, so the organization was sort of flattened mm -hmm. uh, from a supervisory perspective to bring about better, more nimble, and more efficient reporting. So, um, it made off ushered in a lot of, a lot of uh, reforms. Uh, but it really was tough to to be there, to be you know, uh, to be so proud and to say you were from the SEC. Again, not in any way, shape, or form to take away from the the good hard work that I know people did looking into Madoff. But but still, there were issues that you know you you just had to answer to, and it was hard. And did you wind up believing the reforms? Because I know you were there until 2010, so in fact you helped implement many of those reforms. 
do you think there are significant improvements? Do you think they've made it less likely? I guess you can't always fix the problem that occurred in the past. On balance, do you think those were good changes? So I made? think the idea of, of trying to bring specialized, just to, to sort of increase and enhance training around certain specific sort of programmatic uh, areas made sense and there were very, uh, you know, I think obvious benefits, but they were born out of a crisis. Um, when the crisis goes away, then you sort of say, okay, now what's the best way to employ, you know, the specialized, you know, resources in a, in a post-crisis, you know, uh, landscape. And so I think the division's been trying to adjust and, you know, um, you know, to, to that, um, uh, to those new forces and to figure out how to balance things. So overall, um, you know, yes, uh, I think uh, the move to specialization was good. Certainly, um, uh, the process of bringing people in changed dramatically as well. You know, there were sort of, sort of practical exams and different kinds of interview processes. So even on the intake, there was an effort to, to try to find uh, people that uh, they felt had, you know, certain backgrounds and experience levels that were, that were desirable. So. Okay. And then I guess I want to close with a question, which is asking you to reflect back on your close to two decades on the staff about the responsibilities that came with your position and responsibilities to your, to the public, to the victims of crimes, but even to the individuals charged, and how you view your time at the SEC and your reflection on your responsibilities sure. and your time there. So, you know, I love the job. Um, you know, I left for, you know, personal reasons, you know, having to, you know, think ahead and pay for school and all that sort of stuff that, that are the reasons many people leave uh, the jobs they have in the government. Um, I learned a lot. I learned how to be a good lawyer. I think it's helped me tremendously on this side of the, of the table. I learned a lot, again, as I already mentioned, that, you know, um, there's some truly bad people in the world, but more often than not, you're dealing with situations where people have just been put into difficult situations and, and they make bad decisions or bad um, uh, choices. Um, you know, the impact of our cases, you know, um, I would always say to staff attorneys, look, you know, we're the United States government. What we do is going to change people's lives forever the minute we send a subpoena to somebody, even if they're at a company and they get 100 of these a day. Um, you know, they affect people's lives. Um, you know, I sort of had a couple of memories of sort of profoundly experiencing that uh, with a, an insider trading matter that, uh, you know, was going to, we were coordinating with uh, Canada and the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York and um, we got a call that the, the tipper if you will, who was coming to surrender, um, had killed himself. And, uh, you know, we, I just remember sort of walking around for, you know, a few days, just reflecting on sort of, you know, look, I, I you know, whatever brings someone to commit suicide is, you know, a very complicated equation of events and circumstances. But um, even though I didn't feel responsible for that. Nevertheless, it had happened um, and clearly couldn't, you know, couldn't sort of hide from the fact that it did. There was another instance, too, where there had been somebody who uh, committed suicide uh, as a result of, uh, well, not a result, but after a case had been brought. Um, in terms of impact on people's lives, I mean, I, I still remember we brought a case um, uh, that uh, involved a company um, that had a product where they put sp soap inside of a sponge. Uh, and, you know, uh, they were a company and they were a public company and their statements about their revenues and earnings were, we allege, totally fabricated. Yeah, they had some product. Uh, and believe it or not, you could see their advertising you know, if you went to the U.S. Open, there they were. 
Um, but we brought a case, and a lot of people had invested in them. And, and um, I got close to 80 phone calls from people who had invested in that company. Um, I don't think a single one thanked me, and I'm not trying to say that they should have, but mostly they called and said, you know, my life is ruined. I had invested all this money. How could they be a fraud? They can't be a fraud. You're wrong. Um, they were a fraud, um, but I don't think I appreciated at all sort of the consequences, the ripple effect. Um, you know, a lot of times you think that it's just the bad guys trying to make money, but you know, sometimes a fraud, uh, a lot of times a fraud just ensnares truly innocent people who've, you know, I get people calling and saying, you know, it's all the money I had and I got my friends involved and we made this investment and now I've got nothing. You know, why did you do this to me? And it's like, I, I didn't do it to you, but they did it to you, but I, I'm sorry. And I just kept saying, like, I, you know, it was a really tough situation to sort of be in. Um, but I called everybody back and got yelled at over and over again. But I felt it was my responsibility to do that, um, you know, I represented the government. We had brought this action. And so if people called to complain and they were calling to complain to me, I was going to answer all the calls. It wasn't easy. It took over a week, probably two weeks to do, but, and it wasn't easy. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Sure, happy. It's been a fascinating interview. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. It's Great. A fascinating thank you. Interview. I really appreciate you reaching out. I enjoyed it.